And so today we're going to go forward and we're going to do chapter two of the book, which is the story of Rahab. The thing I remember much about Rahab was that there was a Sunday school story about this woman that hid these two spies and they always had a picture of this wall and a little tiny window around the wall like that. There would be a, a red cord or a red ribbon hanging from the window. Pretty much it. it. You didn't get a lot of detail. You know, she just saved the spies and didn't tell anybody about them and all that kind of stuff. Eh, tonight, we're going to get a little bit of detail. We're going to learn a little bit about Miss Rahab, and we're going to see God reveals how she operated and what her motivation was. So before we begin, let's have prayer time. And I'm so thankful y'all are here. Thank you, Father, for tonight, and thank you for bringing these ladies together. And Father, I pray more than anything, you would be honored, and you would be glorified, and your spirit would rule and reign in whatever it is that you prompt me to say. I pray, Lord, that it wouldn't be my opinion, it wouldn't be my thoughts, but it'd be your word and what you want us to hear. I thank you for the opportunity and the technology to do this. And we love you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, just like last week, we're going to start first rattle out of the box, looking at our study guide. And the very first question on our study guide says, It has been said, our lives start and end with family. Our lives start and end with family. Now, you think about all of the celebrations that we have in our culture, our society, a wedding, the family's honored, baby showers, grandma always gets to wear a corsage, you know. We do gender reveals now, and the little, if they're siblings, you know, they get to hold the box or whatever. Um, at a funeral, when we're saying goodbye to someone, the family's honored. The congregation stands and honors the family as they walk in. And so I thought about Rahab. What was her motivation in saying what she did to the spies and in doing what she did. You know, if you think about it, you really do start off with just your mom and dad, maybe a sibling or two. And then when we all say goodbye, that's generally who's standing around. You know, you start and you end with family. My brother turns 50 this weekend. If y'all see him, tell him happy birthday. I can't believe he's 50 because that means I'm old. I remember when he was born. My husband's family just finished a trip this past weekend to Kansas City that's been going on for 34 years that I know of. It started with his granddad and his dad and uncle, and now they have continued that tradition until they are actually taking what would have been granddad's great-great-grandsons. My grandson went on the trip. Family is so essential to our lives. We are so centered around our family. Keep that in mind as we look at Rahab tonight. We're going to start this way. Moses was dead. Joshua was in charge. And the children of Israel were on the brink of taking the land of Canaan that was promised to them by God. But first, they had to break down the walls of Jericho. Now, Jericho is probably more than likely the oldest city in the world. It is still in existence. It's near the Jordan River, the Palestinian territories of the West Bank. You can Google map it on your computer or go look at an atlas and there you'll see Jericho. Jericho was also called the moon city in those days because the citizens worshiped the moon goddess and any other kind of god or goddess that they could come up with or think about. It is here on this 15 foot city wall that our story takes place. People of Jericho had built this wall around their city because of the Israelites and what they had heard about them. So look in Joshua chapter 2, verse 1, and we're going to start there. It said, Then Joshua, the son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the world, he said especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there. The question is often asked, 
and I ask this question myself. Why did they go to a brothel? Why did they go to a house of ill repute? Or as you'd say in East Texas, why did they go to a whorehouse? I mean, everybody in town knew what that was. And everybody in town knew what was going on there. Weren't these guys supposed to be godly men? They were sent by Joshua? Have y'all ever seen a James Bond movie? You know how spies work? Spies go to places where there's a lot of information. And what better place to go than a place that has a lot of traffic, a lot of men coming in and out who are probably partying it up and very talkative. When you think about it, a brothel was a logical place to go for these two guys. This also lets us know that Rahab was a common prostitute. Now, remember last week we talked about old Hiram, when he brought the goat to give to the prostitute, he asked the guys in the city, he said, where's the shrine prostitute or the temple prostitute? When she really, she, she wasn't one. What scripture's letting us know here is that Rahab was a common prostitute. She didn't have anything special about her. People came to her house, had sex, paid money. That's all they did. At any rate, that's where the spies went. They were at her house. But the problem was they were not very discreet about who they were. In Joshua chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, it says, The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Now, did you catch that? He could have sent it to anybody. He sent it directly to her. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they've come to spy out the whole land. Well, that ain't works out so swell. While the spies chose a place that held lots of information, they also chose a place that had lots of people who did all, a lot of listening as well as talking. And so, naturally, the word would get back to the king, hey, there's two strangers, they're hanging out at Rahab's place, and they're asking a lot of questions, and I really think we need to check them out. And so, the king sends a message to Rahab, and he says, hey, woman, I know you got two guys over there. You need to send them to me. Now, there, here's a little something neat that I want you to know about Rahab. The name Rahab means proud broad, and wide. Now, I find that very interesting because I am a broad and wide woman. We always said that us Jones women really came from the Amazons because we're all really tall and really big. I'm wondering if that's the way old Rahab was, if she was a big woman. I really hope it's true because the rest of this story is this. Ancient history says that she was one of the four most beautiful women in the world, along with Sarah, Abraham's wife, Abigail, who was one of David's wives, and Queen Esther. No doubt she had a lot of business at her establishment. We can definitely surmise she was a good businesswoman, probably very shrewd and very believable because she never batted an eye when the king's messenger came to her place and she gave him this response. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, yes, the men came to me, but I don't know where they came from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went, but go after them quickly. You might catch up with them. She had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax that she had laid out on the roof. So the king's men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. So I kind of think of it like this. When the messenger comes knocking on her door, she answers the door and the, mess the guy says, hey, the king says for you to send those two guys to him. And she looks at him and says, Oh, well, there were two guys there here, but I had no idea where they came from. In fact, they rushed out to the city gate as soon as the sun began to set. Now, if you hurry up, you might can catch them. And she just kind of batting her little eyes, you know. 
And just like that, Rahab tricked the king's messengers. They believed her. They swallowed it, hook, line, and sinker. When she saw that they were good and gone, she went up to the rooftop, and she went to where she had laid out the flax. Now, flax is what they used to make linen garments out of. And so it, it, you would lay it out in stalks, and it would dry and all this kind of stuff. It was a great place to hide. And that's what those dudes were doing, man. They were laying underneath that stuff, and they were hiding. Rahab's house was actually built between two city walls. So it had a great view. You know, it's if it's 15 foot tall, you could see forever on the top of that roof. Um, it had a great view, and it was a great way to escape because it was built along the wall. Look at verses 8 through 11. Before the spies lay down for the night, Rahab went up on the roof, and she said to them, now, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and there's a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sin and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear. Everybody's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. After the messengers left, she went up to the roof. And uh, before it was time to go to bed, to go night-night, as we say around here. And she talked to the two spies. And, and she kind of did a little bit of a reality check with them. And she tells them, I know that the Lord has given you this land. Uh, now, that was something coming out of her mouth that the two spies never, ever thought they would hear from someone from Canaan. They didn't realize how their story had traveled. And so then she begins to tell them, Man, we, we've heard about when you left Egypt and how your God opened up the Red Sea. And we've heard about what you did to the kings of the Amorites, how you completely and utterly destroyed them. We're scared to death of y'all for what you could do to us. Now, in those scriptures, there's a couple of three words that are used over and over. It's fear and melting are the two words, and they're used two or three times in there. So I looked them in the Hebrew, and it means terror and horror. They were mortified. They were terrified. And when it says, all that live in this country are melting in fear because of you, it means they're like just you know, they're just disappearing. They're just falling out. In my mind, this is what I thought about. A long time ago and far, far away, when I was in the eighth grade, my mama let me have a sleepover. That was something we never got to do at our house. My sister can attest to that because mom didn't like them children running around all that, making all that noise. I'm just going to tell you that's the way it was. So we had one sleepover and, and we had a, I had a slumber party for my eighth grade birthday. Well, my birthday is November the 5th, because you need to put that on your calendar. That year, when I was in eighth grade, I had invited about 10 junior high girls. Now, think about this. Junior high girls, 10 of them. Those of you that knew my father, he was a really big man. He was six foot six, uh, very tall. The house that we lived in, in Hugh Springs, the front door was really hard to open. And so you couldn't open it from the outside. To come in the house, but my daddy could. He was the only one in the family that could do it. The rest of us never could figure it out. Well, that night, you know, me and my friends, some of us are in my bedroom, some of them are in the living room watching TV, listening to records on a record player. I think we was probably listening to Grease because that was our thing back then. And my dad walks through and he, what I think, locks the front door. What he had actually done was unlocked the front door and then he went back down the hall and went to bed now at that time there was a door in there my parents bedroom that would go outside he went outside and he put on his black trench coat and he put on this mask that he had borrowed from a friend at work and he put on this black hat and then he walks around to the front of the house and opens that front door and just walks in and stands there while all those little bitty girls are playing games and all this kind of stuff. And of all the screaming and wailing and gnashing of teeth, 
it it went. One of my friends went behind the TV stand. One of them tried to go under the couch. Well, I'm in my room with another friend. We're looking at annuals or something. I don't know. And I hear all this screaming. So I get up and start to walk out my door. And right when I get to my bedroom door, there stands this huge person or thing or something in this black outfit with this horrible face. And I literally did what scripture said. I melted. I disappeared. I went away and I went down to the ground and between his legs as far away as I could get. Then I realized it was my dad. But that's what that's talking about. They were so afraid and so scared that they literally just melted away at the thought of the Israelites. But two things about this. This is great news for the spies. It's great news for the spies because that means that their story about what they've been going through and their trek from Egypt and all that stuff, that it's getting around and people are hearing about it. The other part is they're winning the battle already. If folks are already scared of them, all they got to do is say, boo, and they're gone, you know. And so this was, they were thrilled to death with the report that they got from Rahab. But the part that blew their mind was what she said at the very end of that scripture passage. You see, Jericho was a city and the people that lived there worshipped many gods. I told you it was called the moon city, but they had a god for every kind of food. They had a god for fire. They had a god for horses and donkeys and dogs and cats and, you know, anything. You name it, love, war, fertility, you name it, they had a god for it. And when this woman, who owns this house of ill repute, says, for the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. That blew their mind. They had never heard that confessed from someone that was not in on their journey. Your second blank is this. Rahab confesses her faith to the spies in verse 11. In other words, your God is the one and only above all. Rahab knew their God was Yahweh, Jehovah, the existing one. And no one had told her this except Yahweh, Jehovah, the existing one. Look at verse 12. She goes on and says to these two fellas, now remember, they're standing up there on the roof, hiding underneath the flax. And she sent all of her customers away for the evening. And she says, now then, guys, Please swear to me by the Lord, by the Lord, by your God, that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my mother and brother, my brothers and sisters and fathers and all who belong to them and that you will save us from death. You see that word swear right there in that verse, please swear to me. In Hebrew, that word comes from the primitive word for the number seven. Basically, when they asked someone to swear to them, they were saying, I need you to declare to me seven times what you're going to do. So she basically said, repeat to me seven times that you will not kill me and my family. And by my family, I mean my mama, my daddy, my brothers, my sisters, my in-laws, my aunts, my uncles, my nephews, my nieces, my cousins, all my people. You will not kill them. Swear to me. Repeat it to me seven times over. And that's what they did. And then you see at the very bottom, it says, and that you will save us from death. That word save, it means snatch away. Just in the nick of time. That you're going to take us just in the nick of time. Rahab had faith that this God who parted the Red Sea that she had heard about, and performed all those remarkable feats that he could save her and her family. And she was not afraid to ask the spies to spare her. I told y'all she was a shrewd businesswoman. She was not scared of anything. She insisted that they promise to do so. She was taking a huge risk in helping these guys. Why? Because in ancient Middle East, family was what it was all about. Family and the clan was all one and the same. If I had an enemy, then because that person was my enemy, that person was Callie's enemy. 
if I made an enemy, then I made Callie an enemy. <laughs> if I did something wrong and was going to be punished for it, but you know, like if the enemy found me out and I betrayed someone and I was going to be punished, she got in on it too. So Rahab was taking a major, major risk in helping these guys out because they were the enemy. Not only would she be hurt, not only would she get in trouble, but her family would get in trouble too. And they would be in grave danger. Number three is this. We have no idea. We have no idea how Rahab's family treated her, but she honored them as Paul admonished us to in Ephesians 6. Two and three. And we've all heard that verse a hundred jillion times. It goes like this Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. That word honor at the very beginning, that's a def- defined in the Greek as prize, revere, have it's very costly. Okay? It means value, value your family because this is the first commandment with a promise that you will live long, a long life on this earth. In Joshua 2, 14, he goes on and says this, the spies replied to her, our lives for your lives, the men assured her, if you do not tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when, not if, but when, The Lord gives us the land. You know, I have to wonder if the guys are sitting there just just dumbfounded. I mean, here they are standing on the roof of a brothel, looking out over the city of Jericho and back toward the Jordan River where they're camped. And they're talking to this woman that they don't even know who has just promised them that she will keep their secret if they will save her family. And she's also confessed to them that she believes in the God that they worship and that they that they know and that has delivered them. They knew this woman was the real deal. And they realized that only through God and his sovereignty did they just so happen to go to that house. How often have we gauged someone's value based on their appearance and their circumstance. If this had been me and my daughter, a brothel is the last place we would have gone to. We might have gone to the McDonald's or the Starbucks or something like that, but we would not have gone to a brothel. Why? Bad reputation. Don't want to be seen there. Nothing good can come from there, right? God is in the business of changing people, and he does it on his time. And the way he wants to, not on our time, and not what we think. How different this story would have been if those guys would have gone, uh, no, let's don't go right here. Let's go down here to the feedlot, you know? Let's go check these people out down here. Would they have gotten the same information? Would they have been protected? King's messengers heard they were down at the sheep pen. They might have just went right down there and got them. They didn't have any flax to hide in up there. How could she be of any godly use when we're thinking about it and we look at it from our standpoint? We expect people to be like we are. Oh, that we would see people through God's eyes. I've thought about this a lot, this election cycle. I've tried to keep myself from putting my Uh, political views out there for the world to see simply because everything is so icy. But I want to say this to you. All those people that are on the election ballot that you don't like, Jesus died for them too. Just like he died for me and you. We begin to live in such a bubble that we forget there's a world outside of Northeast Texas or Texas or the United States and that Jesus died for everybody and he loves us all just the same. He doesn't look at me and go, well, you know she's a little bit more special because she got online Bible study. (laughs) No, no, not at all. He doesn't look at me any different than anybody else. He died for me on the cross, just like he died for you on the cross, just like he died for Rahab on the cross. It's a hard pill to swallow, 
when we sit there and we think about how we gauge people and how we value people based on what they look like or based on what their circumstances are based on, you know, where they live or whatever. But it's the truth because we as human beings are shallow and biased. And it, and I can promise you this, it's in scripture. Look in 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 7. There was a guy named Samuel who was having a beauty pageant with Jesse's sons trying to find the new king of Israel. And the, the oldest one came by and he was the tallest and he was good looking. And Samuel in his mind thought, well, surely this is the one the Lord has picked out. And the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Oh, that we would see people through the eyes of Jesus. In Joshua 2, verse 15, our story continues. So Rahab let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. And she said to them, Now go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you've tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. Not any window. You catch that? It's got to be the same window that she helped them get out of. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into the house, if any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we're doing, We'll be released from the oath you made us swear. And she replied, I agree. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Now, I seriously wonder if this has ever been made into a movie. You guys, to run for the hills, to stay there for three days, and then the king's messengers, they'll forget about looking for them because they won't be able to find them. And then they can go on across the Jordan, go back to where they came from. And just as she's about to lower them down through the window, they look at her and they said, by the way, all of this stuff that we've agreed to will not count unless you have this red cord hanging from this window. This is your blank number four. Now, I just throw this in there for those of you who like to play trivia because this question may may come up on a trivia game, and it could be the one where you actually win. This could be the win or the lose question for you. The color scarlet that they made the cord came from a dead female grub worm hanging on a tree. Let me explain it to you. There was an insect called a kermes, K-E-R-M-E-S, kermes, and it looked like a scale, like a fish scale. It was like a parasite, and it would attach itself to the tree there in the Middle East. And then when it'd have babies, they'd be little tiny larvae, little grub worms. And so the people would get those grub worms and squish them up and mash them up and uh, add a few, few more things to it, and it would make the color scarlet. That's why the color scarlet was so special, because it was rare. There wasn't a lot of these worms running around. And so that's why it was only used for royalty and for, you know, for her to have that hanging in the window was a little questionable as to where she got that scarlet rope and all that kind of stuff. But here's what I thought. When I realized that this color scarlet only came from this insect hanging on a tree, I remembered that scripture refers to Christ hanging on the tree. And if you look in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, it says this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his stripes, you have been healed. What a cool story that the color that we associate with redemption, red, came from a bug that hung on a tree, just like our redemption came from Christ who hung on a tree. Back to the story. 
the guys tell her, we will not be responsible for any of your family that's not in the house, okay? If your family's not in the house, if they want to be saved, they better be in your house. It was Rahab's responsibility to get them there. My question is this. Do we feel about our families the way Rahab felt about hers? Now, the easy answer is yes, because immediately when we think of family, we think of mom and dad and brother and sister, you know, grandkids, nephews, nieces, blah, blah, blah. What about that great uncle that you see once a year at the family reunion? Are you concerned about his salvation? Or that aunt that used to just pinch your cheeks when you was a little girl that trophy nuts? You think about her salvation? I think in Rahab's story for all of us, that she was so concerned about her family. You notice she named every element of her family. Mama, daddy, brother, sister, and everyone else. She put that caveat in there. And everyone else. She was getting them all in that house. And we should feel the same way about our family. Not just mom and daddy, brother, sister, but everyone else that we tell them about Jesus to save them from the coming destruction. She wasted no time in, her, in tying that ribbon in her window. Now, nobody cared that the town prostitute, for lack of a, you know, can't say the other words, too, it's too graphic, that the town prostitute hung something else in her window. There was probably beads up there and all kinds of carrying on because her house was well decorated so that everybody would know that's what that house was for. So she ties this scarlet cord in the window. Some scholars say that the color red in those times signified a brothel, signified prostitution. I know that in our day and age, if you want to get attention, you wear red. Red shoes, red lipstick, red shirts. If you want to get stopped by the DPS a lot, you drive a red car because they're easy to spot. You know, uh, red high heels, red lipstick, red nail polish, red, 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 red. It's an attention giver. Red is also the color of blood. It's bright. It's loud. It's stained. It's red. It is the blood shed by Jesus on the cross that cleanses us from all of our sin. Not just what we're doing right now, not just what's going to happen, but the sins of the past. And it makes us brand new. It is this blood, it is this color red that saves us. And it's the same color that saves Rahab. Verses 22 through 24 say this, And when the guys left, they went into the hills and they stayed there for three days, just like she told them, until the pursuers had searched all along the road and they returned without finding them. Then the two men started back, and they went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. So the spies returned to Joshua, and they began to tell him what they had done. It kind of went something like this. All right, Joshua, we got in the city of Jericho. We um, found this place. Well, you know, the first place we went was this, this, this brothel. And Joshua was standing there going, what, huh, what? You did what? And, well, the madam there, she hit us on the roof. And the king's guys came and were going to take us away. And she she saved our life. And then we promised that we would save hers when we came to take over the city. I'm wondering if Joshua was just standing there with his mouth hanging open like, what did you guys just promise to do? Rahab, in the meantime, watched them run out across the field or wherever they went, made sure that cord was hanging in her window, and she waited. And she waited, and she waited, and she waited. And I wonder if she began to wonder if, are these guys ever going to come back? Did they, are they really going to attack this city? But she never took that cord out of her window, and her faith never faltered. 
Finally, in the sixth chapter of Joshua, things get moving again. And one morning, Rahab awakens to hear footsteps. Not just a little pitter-patter of little feet, but footsteps. Now see, y'all got to realize that this group of people that came from Egypt that have been coming along forever how many years now? It's not just about 100 folk. It's one million people. And they had to get across the Jordan River, which just so happened to be at flood stage. So God just did another miracle, parted the Jordan River. They walked right on through, came and headed toward Jericho. And then he told them he said, take all the army, get them in these certain groups, put the Ark of the Covenant in the front, put the priests up there with some horns. We fist to march around the city of Jericho. And that's what they did. And that morning, Rahab wakes up and she hears these these footsteps. And we're talking clonk, 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 clonk. Lots of noise, lots of footsteps. And she realizes that's the Israelites. It's time for me to get my family. I got to get busy. And then after they'd been around the city one time, they blew the trumpets. And then they left. Well, that was kind of anticlimactic. But then the next morning, when she woke up, she heard the same thing again. And there they go again, marching around the city. It took them a long time. It just, just wasn't like, whoop, whoop, that was it. No, it took them a long time to get around that city. They marched around the city, and when they marched around it one time, the priest blew the trumpets again. And she's watching all this out the window, and her family, they're, they're standing there looking over her head, trying to figure out what is that big gold box those people are carrying on that pole? What are they doing? This makes no sense whatsoever. But her faith, never faltered. And I have to wonder, as she watched those people walk around that city for six thinking days, wonder if she's looking for those spies. Do you think they remember who I am? Do you think they see this red cord hanging in my window? I mean, it's kind of like when your kids were in the band, you invite your friend to come watch them march. Well, the friend don't know which one is your kid because A, they don't know what instrument they're playing and B, everybody's dressed alike, right? So it's the same way on this deal. She has no idea where those spies are. They all wearing long robes and stuff on their head. She can't see them. She don't know who's who. She's just hoping they're out there, and she's hoping they see that red cord in the window. Look at verse 15. On the seventh day, they, the army, got up at daybreak, and they marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that in it are to be, be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies that we sent. Verse 20 says, When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and they destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and don't. The seventh day, Rahab looks out her window and she sees those crazy Israelites again, still walking around that city. But this time they did it seven times. And on the seventh time, the priests blew the trumpets. And when they blew the trumpets, everybody screamed really loud. And the next thing you know, the walls came tumbling down. And that 15-foot wall just went, just fell. Now, I have to assume that her house was perfectly fine. Because spies had promised her that she would be okay. And the Lord honored their promise. In the Bible, the number seven is the number for completion. So it's no wonder that God did all this on the seventh time around the city. I mean, he created the world and rested on the seventh day. There are seven holy days to the Jewish people. Revelation, the book of Revelation, is full of references to the number seven. So, of course, in his perfect way, he used the seventh time around for the specific time for the walls to come tumbling down. Imagine what that sounded like. Imagine that cacophony of noise that was going on. Imagine what Rahab heard outside of her door. Because when those walls fell, the scripture says the army rushed in and they took the city and they destroyed 
every living thing. Every living thing. You know she's got to be a little bit worried. What's going through her mind as she's hearing all this screaming and shouting and carrying on? She couldn't tell who the spies were, and she couldn't tell if they were out there, and she couldn't tell if they saw the red rope hanging out of her window. And look at verse 22. Joshua said to the two men who spied out the land, I find it funny that they were hanging out with the leader of the group. Go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family, and they put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it. But they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. I imagine when that wall came tumbling down and she could hear that army rushing through to take over that city and to destroy everything. Don't you know that she was just, it was just all she could take? And then she hears a knocking on her door. And then she hears those voices that she remembers. Rahab, Rahab, we're here, we're here. I'm sure that was the sweetest voice she had ever heard. Her and her family to safely. And they sat there and watched as the city of Jericho burns to the ground. And the rest of verse 25 says, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. Now that does not mean that Rahab is immortal, okay? Here's what that means. She married a man named Salmon or salmon, depending on how you want to say it, wouldn't it be great if he was one of those spies, you know, that saved her life? But anyway, that's for the, the spy movie. I think we should send this to Mel Gibson. But she married this guy named Salmon, and they had a son named Boaz, who just happened to be the great-grandfather of King David. So look at my last blank here in number five. Rahab is not remembered for her prostitution. She is remembered for her bravery. One's past does not determine one's future. One's past does not determine one's future. I imagine that that morning that Rahab got up and opened up her place of business, and the spies came in, that she never dreamed her life would end like it did in three or four weeks, ever how long it was, until the Israelites came and took the city of Jericho. She probably never could have planned that out. And I promise you she couldn't plan out marrying some dude named Salmon and having the great granddaddy of the greatest king that Israel has ever known. Not to mention the fact that the Messiah, the anointed one, came from the same line. And so Romans 8, 1 says this, is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Because Rahab believed God and she trusted God, and she had faith, she's not condemned anymore. She is free from the law of sin and death. Um, her lineage lives on because King David is the ancestor of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And we are adopted daughters of God. If we are believers in Jesus Christ, we are adopted daughters of God, sisters to Christ, and granddaughters of Rahab. I think she has an incredible, incredible story. When I read this story and I thought about her, my mind went to Miss Kitty and Gunsmoke because she was tough, you know, and she always took care of 
of Matt and Festus and Doc and all of them. But the people of the city, if you watch a lot of the episodes, you'll get this. The people of Dodge City, they always thought Kitty was a little bit lower than everybody else because she owned a saloon and she had saloon girls. And so she was never quite in society. Now, she was for Matt and she was for Doc and Festus. You know what that makes me think about that when we do things God's way, it's a whole lot easier. Not near as many mountains to climb when we do things God's way. A lot of times it's a whole lot easier. And I'll see you in two weeks. Two weeks. Bye.